Good morning. Um, for the few of us who are present here, it is such a privilege to be here in the presence of Professor Ricardo Ortiz. Uh, it is something that I am extremely excited about, especially because we have uh, a student of his amongst us, um, Isa Ayubi. He's a PhD student at Jindal, and he's been able to connect us with him. And the reason that we have him here is because he brought him here. Right? So thank you so much. Um, we are hosting him on behalf of the Mahatma Gandhi Center for Peace Studies. And the center has be, is very nascent. We are only a year old. But we stand to try and foster a certain amount of intellectual and critical research within, within the area of peace studies, a part of which is studying social movements and how social movements would impact a lot of um, different uh, causes that we might have. So if a particular social movement will actually be fruitfully justifiable to lead to a particular outcome, or would that out outcome even become possible, right? Uh, and that is something which we can learn a lot about from Professor Ortiz. We also um, here have a student wing uh, of sorts. So this student wing is called the Students for Peace. And we are trying to foster the same kind of intellectual curiosity and social awareness and activism among students because they are the ones who are going to eventually end up shaping the rest of our future, right? So if students are already thinking about peace, then we will be in better hands in the future. And that is one of the objectives for Students for Peace to exist. And it is less a wing or less connected to the center, more hopefully eventually a global movement. Uh, to begin the talk and just to introduce the center a little more and introduce our ideas a little more, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ramin Jahan Beglu, who is the executive, executive director of the center. And um, he will tell you a little more about our work, what we plan to do, and uh, we'll also welcome Professor Ortiz better. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You don't need to applaud. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Shama, and uh, Encantado, Professor Ortiz. I say a few words in his own language, native language, which is Spanish. And uh, very happy to have you here with us. Uh, I'm, ho I'm sure that we're going to have a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, though the number, uh, the, the, the quantity is not uh, favorable in uh, our manner of seeing things, but I'm sure the quality is quite high here. And so <laughs> it usually happens at Jindal. Um, anyway, yes, um, um, we're gonna talk today about um, America's social, uh, actually, situation, political situation, and uh, this is one of the issues which interests uh, uh, me and actually the center, Shama and others. Uh, since uh, it's a center based on peace and nonviolence. And uh, one of the heroes of uh, our center, uh, not only Mahatma Gandhi, but is Martin Luther King Jr., uh, on whom I've done a book uh, very recently and been working on him for a long period of time. And everybody knows that uh, if uh, we speak of um, MLK, and especially this year, which is in 2018, the 50th anniversary of his assassination, uh, we go directly to the heart of social movements and uh, the American dream, what we can call the American dream, which was so important for uh, MLK and people around him. Uh, many of the uh, uh, people who worked with him uh, are today in, in American politics, like uh, Congressman John Lewis, uh, or you have Andrew Young. Uh, so uh, it's very important to have uh, Professor Ortiz with us today and be able to talk about um, uh, Trump's America. Maybe it's the differences with uh, uh, the time of the Kennedys and uh, especially because uh, uh, Professor uh, Armin Rosenkranz, he's, uh, he knew that period very well. He worked with Robert Kennedy very closely. And uh, from my point of view, actually, people like MLK and what they can represent, still represent today um, in America and elsewhere. Um, actually, this is the subject that uh, I've been passionate of and uh, been writing about, is not 
to talk about the biography of these characters like Gandhi and um, Martin Luther King Jr., but to talk about the relevance for our world. For, for example, the question that I will put to uh, Professor Ortiz would be, uh, what does he think would be the relevance of uh, somebody like MLK in Trump's America? Does he have any relevance? And with everything that we saw in uh, Jacksonville, in Charlottesville, uh, all around, uh, and the problem of racism still being the problem of inequality and poverty being the, uh, do we need do we need moral leaders like that? Uh, God knows that India needs this kind of. I mean, especially with the BJP government, we need to have new Gandhis and uh, maybe moral leaders more and more for our world. So I'm sure that. Um, for you students and professors, it would be very interesting the debate that we can have on new social movements today in the world. Uh, next to the rise of populism that we have among the political leaders, and not only in the Americas, but mainly uh, also in the Middle East with people like Erdogan, in Latin America, uh, in Venezuela, uh, other places of the world, uh, with Modi, Mr. Modi in uh, India, and many other places. So um, with this, I would like to invite Professor Ortiz to take the floor, and we want to be very much enjoyed to listen to you. Please. So uh, I invite uh, Isa Yubi to just introduce Professor Ortiz and tell us a little more about him before you, we hear from Professor Ortiz himself. All right, thank you, Shama, for giving me the opportunity to praise my former professor. In fact, and I have a lot of passion to do so. I, I came across knowing Professor Ortiz in 2008 when I started my journey of, uh, you know, educational journey in Thailand. And he was the head of this university's uh, IR program, Webster University. And uh, I, I learned a great deal of uh, knowledge from him and I benefited a lot. And since then we have been in, uh, in, in direct contact. And, uh, and it's a privilege to have him here. At the same time, I would like to say something about the center. In fact, this is a great center that we have at JGU at this time, that we are in a really high times. You know, a lot of people are advocating for things it's more aggressive and you know, nonviolence. I would just really recommend and, and, and you know, encourage students to participate and make the center one of the most uh, vibrant and active center JGU has ever had. And thank you so much. And, and Professor Ortiz is a great lecturer, and you will enjoy it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Well, first of all, uh, good morning um, to all of you, and thank you for attending. Um, I'm very honored to, to actually be here. Um, this is a, a bit overwhelming for me. I wasn't really expecting uh, such... Uh, such a reception uh, at, at all. I, I tried to be uh, as low profile as I can. Um, not necessarily because I'm trying to hide anything, it's just uh, I, I don't necessarily feel that I have uh, too much to offer. Um, I'm more of a question type of individual. I like to get people to think and to ask questions. Not necessarily do I feel that I have all the answers uh, or that I have astonishing information or knowledge to share. But uh, for me, it really all boils down to the questions. Are we asking the right questions? And are we actually pursuing uh, those questions to find the answers that, that will help us to understand and comprehend the situation uh, that is uh, in front of us? Um, as I said, very honored to be here, so thank you to the two of you uh, for allowing me this time. Thank you, Ayub, um, Professor Rosecrans, thank you for your attendance again today. Um, I, you know, thinking about this topic and the significance of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and um, nonviolence and whatnot, I come from a country that was touched by this particular philosophy. Uh, in fact, I like to tell a lot of people, um, especially my students, 
If it wasn't for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I would not be here at all. Uh, this one man and his ideas uh, changed the country, uh, forced it in many ways to change, to confront itself in a way that perhaps uh, many Americans um, maybe were not ready. I am the son of immigrants. Both of my parents came from Mexico. Um, and I'd like to point out, uh, legally. Uh, they didn't run across the border, they legally migrated to the United States. And uh, I often asked my parents, why did you come to the United States? They sacrificed everything. They came from a country where they had everything. They could have had the best jobs, the best houses, a lot of privilege. They went to the United States. Why? It's interesting the response that my parents would give me. Opportunity, a dream. They were in the United States when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was very active. And they were there at the time of his assassination. In fact, I was born in the year of his assassination. Um, so understanding a little bit about myself perhaps has uh, forced me to understand a little bit about the history of my own country, um, my roots, uh, my origins, but perhaps more importantly nowadays, where are we heading? Where is this country heading? Um, and in many instances, I'm very concerned, mainly because the leaders, the, let's say, icons of our moral and ethical compass have now disappeared in many instances, and now we are left with individuals that really do not represent the best of what we are as Americans, um, or how other people around the world view us as Americans, or how they view America. Uh, very quickly, just wanted to kind of give you an idea of um, some of the aspects that I want to touch on but as I said, I, I, I really want to throw things out there for us to ask questions. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and assume that you do not know anything. Um, I'm here to just, again, share my experiences as a son of two Mexican immigrants and to kind of give you a sense of some of the aspects that uh, I find uh, very uh, interesting and necessary. But more importantly, what's happening in America today? And where has the message of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gone? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? Professor Rosecrans, you probably are very familiar with this line from a very popular song um, during the 1960s um, in the United States. That was a time that the United States was experiencing a lot of internal uh, tension, a lot of dissent going on. Uh, the Vietnam War was in full swing in 1968. In fact, again, in 1968, not only was there the assassination of the Reverend Martin, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., but also the assassination of Robert Kennedy and the Tet Offensive in South Vietnam. This was a year that was extremely violent, but in many instances, it kind of forced uh, many Americans to start asking themselves some very, very profound questions. What kind of country are we in which, on the one hand, we aspire for peace um, and democracy and justice, and on the other hand, we are very violent, not only to others, but also to ourselves. The cultural wars that we now are experiencing, uh, it often would be mentioned as kind of like a byline um, but now I believe more than anything it is very real in terms of the left and the right, conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, and how many Americans are holding on to these labels as identity characteristics. I am a Republican, I am a Democrat, and that is tied to particular ideology and a particular identity which is dividing people nowadays and in fact even families. Um, the Donald Trump factor, um, <laughs> I still don't understand how this has happened, but it has. We need to deal with it, and hopefully we will not repeat it. Um, but there's one thing I've learned is that we tend to repeat history. We like it, I guess. Um, I'm not sure what else. But the Donald Trump factor, what I'd like to insert here, is that in many instances it's caused the divisions to become even deeper. Not necessarily that the divisions were created, but they have actually become very, very deep. Uh, and the language that is actually being used nowadays 
uh, in the United States is extremely, extremely divisive, and I would have to even say very, very uh, personal. Um, if you are conservative, you are this. If you are liberal, you are this. Um, if you are a Republican and on the right, you are a racist. If you are a liberal and on the left, you are a communist and a snowflake, and the words go on and on and on. This language uh, is, is quite unique in terms of its repetition. The end of the American dream? Well, I would like to say the end of perhaps the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. Are we looking at that? Because if it's that dream that we're looking at its demise, then I feel very sad indeed for my own country. Where, where are we at this moment? Again, at one point, the United States produced great men uh, like the Reverend um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I think all of you are very aware of his iconic speech, I Have a Dream which in many instances, uh, the first time that I read it, um, it really struck me, mainly because I think as Americans, um, this is my take, I think as Americans we are dreamers. We love to dream. We love to aspire for something that is greater than us. Um, are we necessarily perfect? No, we're not. But we are dreamers. And that's something that I've come across on a personal level. Uh, friends and family, dreaming of becoming this or becoming that, dreaming of own, owning their own home, dreaming of traveling the world. And in many instances, I think this man really embodied something that was quintessentially American. Um, but again, the message of equality, of justice, of fairness, um, of, of a real social democracy that this individual uh, communicated at one point in our history I think we're, we're forgetting about it, and in fact, I would like to say uh, at this very moment that perhaps his relevance is quickly disappearing, and that is our loss. This is our loss. I have a dream. I, as an American, have a dream, and in fact, in many instances, I am fulfilling that dream. Um, so maybe I am one of the few. America is a nation of immigrants. It's always been a nation of immigrants. And rather than trying to reject it, I believe that we should embrace it. However, we also need to be very cognizant of one truth. Every single wave of immigrant who has come to the United States has experienced rejection. This is the truth. Not any group of immigrants has been embraced. There are trials and tribulations for every single group of immigrant has, who has come to the United States. Every single group. Prejudice, discrimination, racism. It's, it's perhaps a, a part of our story, but we are a nation of immigrants and we'll continue to be a nation of immigrants. Regardless of what the politicians may say, we will continue to be a nation of immigrants, but this is our story. And yet at the same time, uh, in many instances, this nation of immigrants is dividing itself. Um, and how? Well, in many instances, ideologically looking at blues and reds, Republicans and Democrats. We're now even looking at ourselves as to what states we come from, and therefore, whatever state we come from, we must actually be fitting with that ideological label. If you come from California, you must be a liberal. You must be a Democrat. You must be on the left. Oh, really, are you serious? Are you saying that there's no diversity within these states? Or have we gotten to the point that we are now beginning to see, well, our country as being ideologically different from the rest because of the states that we come from? Um, yes, perhaps some states tend to vote more Republican than Democrat, but does that necessarily mean that you know, we stop being a part of one nation? Um, but this is, again, something that is beginning to become more pronounced uh, over the years, the, the ideological divisions that one finds you know, throughout the country, uh, the, the colors and, and the, again, the liberalism and the conservatism and whatnot. Just to give you a sense of, again, looking at the previous election, um, if one were to look at a map of the United States, one could say that uh, it's more red than blue. 
And yet at this very moment, I do not necessarily subscribe to this map and say, well, this means that most Americans tend to be Republicans and conservatives and those on the right, and therefore that I cannot find any common cause with them. I come from a state that is overwhelmingly liberal, and yet my experience in the United States is those people that I tend to get along with very, very well tend to be Republicans, those on the right, and conservative mainly because I don't necessarily subscribe to the ideologies here. Or maybe that's my fault. I've been living outside of the United States for 18 years. I see myself different. But again, in the United States, this is very real in terms of the divisions. Um, and it's becoming more pronounced, not less, more. Um, people who were not politically active 10 years ago are now becoming active and now beginning to refer to themselves as staunch Democrats or staunch Republicans. And yet, 10 years ago, they were apolitical, not involved at all, at all. And when I say not involved, they did not even vote. And the reason why I can uh, point that out is because within my own family, that has been the case. I still remember years ago, my, some of my family members would ask me, why are you studying political science, history? international relations, and my answer was, I want to be aware of the world. I don't want to make the wrong choices. Well, what can you do with political science? Vote? Well, yes, I could perhaps be a little bit more knowledgeable. Ten years later, these same people are now wanting to be active. But I've told them time and time again, you should have been active a little bit longer than just a few months ago. You should have been aware. Um, how much of this is, again, true? How much of it is, again, something constructed by the media? Um, but the culture wars, again, are real. And in many instances, the presidency of Donald Trump has emphasized it even more so, not necessarily created it. Taking a look very carefully about immigration, and this is perhaps one of the issues that I think is extremely important, not only for the United States, but I would say for many countries around the world. The issue of immigration. And one thing that I, I am very, very adamant about, it is a legitimate issue to be discussed openly and honestly. On the one hand, we cannot just simply open up our borders and say everyone is welcome. On the other hand, we can't just simply say, let's close our doors. We need to find a middle ground here. But in no way is a discussion about immigration to be interpreted as wanting to close doors. There has to be an honest and frank discussion about this issue. Not just simply say, well, you know what, let's just open doors and accept everyone or just close them and not accept anyone. Every single country in the world is in many ways touched by this one issue. I come from a country that has the issue of immigration. Keep in mind, I am not a Thai citizen and I never will be a Thai citizen. I will always be a foreigner never perhaps allowed to obtain citizenship, never allowed to actually buy property, I will be a foreigner. And yet Thailand itself has the issue of immigration also very much on top of its agenda. What should Thailand do? So it's not just, again, only an American issue. But again, it's interesting that immigration has always played an important role in our society. And perhaps, perhaps, I would like to argue it has contributed to the culture wars that we see today. Let me explain that because I don't want you to get the impression that it is immigrants that are causing the culture wars. But there are certain aspects about immigration that is causing the United States to change irrevocably, permanently. And in some instances, these changes, from what I see, are making certain Americans feel very, very uncomfortable. Let me, again, uh, touch on that. Let me show you this graph. This color right here represents immigrants from Mexico. Didn't say Mexico, I said Mexico. Um, there are many parts of the United States today you will not hear English. It will only be Spanish. 
only Spanish. Now, come to think of it, as an American who perhaps comes from maybe the state of Minnesota, going to one part of the United States that he or she believes is within the United States and only here in Spanish, they begin to wonder, where am I? And why are these people not speaking English? Everywhere they go, they hear Spanish. Whose country is this? Well, it's everyone's country. It's just people are now making a preference to speak in a different language. Um, just want to share something very quickly with you. In 2012, I went back to the United States, and I spent uh, three months there very quickly helping out with, um, my family uh, with some business. And I'll never forget, everywhere I was going in Los Angeles, uh, people would speak to me in Spanish. If I go to a fast food place, they speak to me in Spanish. If I go to a hardware store, they speak to me in Spanish. Always Spanish. After a while, I, be, I start to think, do I have a t-shirt that says, you know, please speak to me in Spanish? I mean, or else why is everyone speaking to me in Spanish? You look Latino. You look Mexican. Therefore, you must know how to speak Spanish. Well, that's not necessarily the case, because I remember growing up as a child, there were other Mexican-American kids who could not speak Spanish. In fact, in my neighborhood, I was the only one who could speak Spanish, but not the only Mexican-American, because their parents had basically said, you're an American, you speak only English. My parents made a decision, you are Mexican-American, but that's it. You are Mexican-American. You must learn also the culture of Mexico. So that, in 2012, hit me very hard. I can speak Spanish, but I was shocked by the prevalence of Spanish. Keep in mind, we're not talking about isolated pockets here of Spanish-speaking communities. We're now looking at entire sections of the country where Spanish is prevalent, where the immigrants have made a huge impact upon the local environment, a huge impact. And again, I'm not saying that this is negative. This is a part of the American story. Not to be rejected, but in fact to be embraced. Because these same people also view themselves as American. These same people will actually sacrifice themselves for their country. Not necessarily to reject it, but to actually embrace America as well. But again, it's interesting. As a Mexican-American, here's my connection with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One of the reasons why I told you from the very beginning that I owe him so much is because he inspired other individuals to fight for civil rights. And one of those individuals was Cesar Chavez, a labor organizer of farm workers in California. And most of these farm workers are being Mexican or Mexican-Americans champion a cause that you know, was very American and at the same time resisted by many individuals. But because of these individuals, and because of the words and the actions of certain people like Cesar Chavez or the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which again are tied to you know, the, the words and actions of Mahatma Gandhi, they've changed the world and they've had impact on individuals, individuals like myself. But I'd like to point something out and emphasize it. The culture wars are real, but in many instances, the culture wars are really based upon the influx of immigrants. But again, I'm not saying that these immigrants are to be found at fault. It's just they are having a profound impact. They're obligating Americans who are monolingual to all of a sudden wake up and say, maybe I should learn some Spanish. Maybe I should learn some Mandarin. Maybe I need to learn a little bit more about the world in which I'm living in because now the world is here and it's having an impact upon my own community. The last time I was in uh, Ohio, uh, my father lives in Ohio. This is uh, considered a, to be a red state. In fact, the part of the Ohio that he lives in is very, very Republican. Very Republican. But it's interesting, driving around that part of Ohio, all of a sudden you see Hindu temples and a mosque. It's like, wow. This is quite interesting. Out in the middle of nowhere, you see a mosque and a Hindu temple. And what's even more interesting, nothing ever happens to those mosques or temples. They're accepted. These are members of our community. This is change. This is fundamental change. And yet, these individuals have been able to find space. Which, again, leads me to this other observation. The culture wars. Are we creating 
division where division should not even exist? Or is the division really real? And therefore, perhaps the future is not necessarily that bright for us. Have we forgotten the American dream? The dream of Martin Luther King Jr. Can we ever find another individual who will lead us to again the promise and the hope? Because as I said in the very beginning, we as Americans are dreamers. 100% we dream. And I have to say perhaps that's what makes us different. Or maybe the same like many other people who dream as well around the world. So that's my... Um, <laughs> presentation. Thank you very much and <laughs> open for any questions or comments. Professor, for, for that. Yes, I mean, I, I would uh, definitely uh, label um, the United States as being a broken community. Now, what I also would like to point out is from the perspective of the media, there are many parts of the United States where you do find communities existing very peacefully. Um, but in many instances, the media likes to uh, reverberate this message of real division uh, amongst Americans, uh, or in some instances even uh, not even, let's say, emphasize it. So coming from Los Angeles, I can tell you that, uh, you know, when, when people talk about, uh, you know, the, the so-called racial divisions, you know, that, that exist, they, you know, the, the media put, puts it out there and people imagine black and white. You go to Los Angeles, it's not necessarily between blacks and whites. In Los Angeles, it's between Latinos and blacks. But the media tends to forget that. Not, well, no, no, no. We, we, can't, we can't go into, into that uh, area because we're talking about two constituencies that are very important for the Democratic Party. We, we can't have that. So let's, let's overlook this. But it is very, very real. In Los Angeles, uh, there are instances, I would term them as ethnic cleansing, where Latino gangs purposefully target blacks 
for, for violence in order to push them out of certain parts of Los Angeles. And there are, again, many instances of that. Um, does that mean that all Latinos and blacks are fighting against each other? No, not at all. But in many instances, the media likes to, again, emphasize certain messages which leads people to believe that it is a broken community. And yet, at the same time, there are many parts of the United States where communities are very strong, they're very, very multicultural, uh, they've embraced this diversity, uh, and they're making it work. Um, the beloved community. And, and keep in mind that, you know, what's interesting is, is that uh, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, message, um, in, in many instances, continues to kind of be a beacon for, for many individuals. I mean, can we aspire to, to become that? Uh, can we? And there are individuals who, in their own way, try to create these beloved communities. But overall, I mean, from my perspective, I would say that we are pretty much a broken community. And uh, let me state something very clearly here. Not because of one particular ideological group. It's we as a collective, we're responsible. This culture of violence is our, our creation. Look at movies, and TV programs, and, and video games. This is not, again, something that we can just simply say, well, you, Second Amendment uh, supporters, you're responsible for this. Because no one is, let's say, uh, campaigning against Hollywood to stop with all of the non, um, you know, the, the, the non-necessary violence that, that we see uh, in film and in TV programs. So I'm, I'm part of that. All right, I'm not going to say it's those Americans. I'm part of it. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'd like to talk briefly about uh, Trump taking advantage of certain native strains in America. Nativism, racism, the tradition of turning out parties after two terms, uh, rather than being uh, the beginning of a new trend in American politics. I mean, I think that, uh, but for 80,000 people out of, uh, I don't know what the total electorate was, but uh, uh, 80 million probably or more, that's not a very, you know, it's a very, very tiny percentage. Um, and we had a very uh, unfortunate candidate who, first of all, was a woman, uh, but we never had a woman uh, president, and was very tied into the banks. We never, I don't think we ever had that explicit tie before. So, um, and she wasn't uh, highly principled, neither of course was he, but it wasn't a, an ideal contest of, uh, you know, progressive and conservative. It was more, you know, well, we don't particularly like her. He, uh, uh, Obama had been there for two terms. and. Trump did appeal to nativism and anti-immigration and loss of jobs and uh, a feeling of being uh, surrounded by <coughs> newer Americans uh, who have, in some, in some cases, taken away their jobs and their financial security. So I, I'm hopeful that this is really a very passing instance of, you know, various things coming together to enable the election of a, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, an irrational, uh, <coughs> solipsistic, Yes. 
this that we're not uh, uh, that our politics is erratic, but it's not shifting markedly in one direction. Do you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, well, just uh, very you quickly. Like round take, uh, round take sure, 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 go ahead. So, uh, with regard to the culture wars that you've been speaking of, I was wondering the, the kind of role model minorities should be playing in this and how they could perhaps be a mitigating factor. Or really, I mean, what kind of, uh, would you say they contribute to the issue because they're seen as model citizens? and they try to remove themselves from other problematic communities and decide not to engage in the issue at all. I mean, it's just like your views on that. Okay, well, um, actually, uh, let me uh, start off with uh, Professor Rosencrantz's uh, observations. Yes, the, uh, the nativism, uh, the racism, uh, that, uh, again, are very much tied to to you know, uh, the American experience, uh, the Trump really has played on them. Um, and I'll never forget you know, uh, some of the comments he made about uh, Mexicans, you know. Uh, some of you are this and that, and, but some of you are, are, are good. I'm like, well, I, I, I guess that means my parents are good, you know, so that's, that's nice to know. Um, and yet, at, at the same time, Professor Rosencrantz, I, I have to uh, like to, to point out uh, to, to people, look, we also have to be aware of one very, very, very dark reality. Along the U.S.-Mexican border, those drug cartels are very active. And, and we're not talking about the best type of people here. The, this is a security situation that needs to be addressed. Are you going to address it by building a wall? No, they'll get around that. You're, you're not going to eliminate the threat by building a wall. But at the same time, to make that type of generalization in public very openly um, is, in my opinion, very, very uh, irresponsible. Uh, but he was touching on something that, that again, you know, reverberated with the audience. The, the audience loved to hear that. They were like, finally, someone is saying the truth. Um, but in, in many instances, um, you know, there were probably would, would be people who would say, well, that's not the case. But I, 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 see, I see your point in, in many instances. Uh, this nativism uh, is something that he, he, he definitely touched on and to great effect. To great effect, unfortunately, because then it really begins to communicate the message to me. Maybe that has not really gone away. I mean, it's, it's still there, um, but it's incredible. It's 2018 and it's still there. Th this should have been gone a long time ago. And in fact, you know, uh, you definitely have a wealth of experience in terms of, you know, the 60s, you lived it. I mean, you experienced it. I mean, th this was, again, not something, you know, to be read. You lived in an era where you had these, you know, monumental individuals um, challenging us as a society, you know, to, to become better. I mean, you have the, 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 the death and destruction of the Vietnam War, and all of a sudden, you know, Americans who are going around saying, yes, we're, we're here for the betterment of the world. Well, how, is, how you make the world better by destroying, you know, um, three, three countries? I mean, I, or, and not only just simply destroying three countries, but entire generation of young Americans who have gone out there to fight and all of a sudden realizing there's, there's really no reason to fight. We, in, in many instances, uh, have to learn from, from our lessons. And I also would like to, uh, to say, I, I really do hope, Professor Rosenkranz, that, you, that you're right. I, I really don't want this to be you know, the, the future. Um, I mean, if it's, if it's a passing trend, we need to see some, some light at the tunnel. We, we really do. Um, the question is, is who? Who? I mean, as I mentioned last uh, yesterday, Oprah Winfrey, please. No, no, we, we, let, let's, let's stop with the jokes. Let's start finding the right people. Seriously, let's start finding the right people and giving them the space to, to really, you know, um, challenge us, make us better, you know, help us to dream. Um, the question that, that you pose concerning immigrants, um, I would say that the numbers, uh, and, and let me just kind of go back uh, to to this, uh, the numbers are, are playing a significant role. 
Uh, Mexican Americans uh, are around 25, 30 million people. So Americans either of, um, uh, let's say, Mexican origin or Mexican Americans. In other words, they were born and raised in the United States, not in Mexico, or even people from Mexico who have become uh, American citizens. Uh, 25, 30 million people, politically, you're beginning to, to actually, you know, carry some clout. And um, this is beginning to, to be seen in, let's say, local, uh, local constituencies as well as state, uh, state level, uh, as well as, as federal in some instances. Uh, immigrants, I think, um, have always been um, very, very, let's say, beneficial for, for the United States. Um, I, I've, I'm not going to say, well, all immigrants are perfect and you know, they're all law-abiding and whatnot. I mean, you'll always find a very, very, very small minority that you know, uh, does not fit that particular label. But immigrants um, will always continue to be very, very positive contributors to the growth and development of American society. Uh, so much so that they're the ones who sometimes really push the banner of expanding um, the democratic electorate and, and making sure that the process really does work. And the reason is because I, for, for one, um, truly believe in the, in the words that, that are, again, you know, found in, within the Constitution of, of the United States. I, I believe in them. I mean, I, that, that's something that, uh, you know, I'm not only was I taught, but I, I feel that this is the cornerstone of, of my American identity, um, not, not skin color or religious, uh, let's say, uh, affiliation, but, but the belief in the Constitution. Um, and immigrants, by and large, uh, I do believe, um, especially Mexican Americans, feel this is the time to get involved. Um, and there is great utility. So if you look at you know, the, the border between the United States and Mexico, Mexico is not moving away, and the United States is not moving away. These are two countries that are joined at the hip. And this community can serve as a bridge to be able to solve some of the most pressing issues that confronts both of our countries. So the drug wars that takes place in, in Mexico, it just doesn't only stay in Mexico, it also spills over into the United States. We need that cooperation and coordination in order to resolve that particular um, security uh, dilemma. But let me point again something out. Immigrants have always contributed to America. They've always. And maybe because they're the ones who really do dream the most. And they push to achieve that dream. They really do push. Um, I never under, underestimate immigrants and their work ethic. I never do. Because they're, they're the ones who really want to achieve something that they have read and they believe in. When you believe in something, you sometimes do the impossible to achieve it. So I, I, I find them to be very inspiring. I, I really do. So now that's just my take on it, mainly because you know, the times that I've gone to Ohio and I see you know, the, um, the, the, the local Hindu community or the local Muslim community, they're the hardest working. They're always involved in every single community activity. You know, just giving, 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 giving. And what's interesting is that you know, the local community has embraced them as being part of their community. So you can't touch them, you know, <laughs> you, you, you can't. You know, they're part of the community, but does that necessarily mean that you know, they're best friends with everyone? Not necessarily, but people will respect you know, what they've been able to contribute. As I said, immigrants have contributed and they will continue to contribute. Do we have any further questions? Um, I will take this opportunity to answer questions myself. Um, I was wondering if you see any parallels between what is happening in the U.S. and what happen, is happening in, in India currently. Because there are a ton of people who did not see these divisions as you were trying to uh, explain in the beginning. Are these divisions really real? Uh, or are they just founded by us constructs which we can work um, to deconstruct, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in India as well, um, this, like, my current students, right, and uh, though I don't feel like I belong to a very different generation, even up until I was in grade school, there was very few people who would say, I have a Muslim friend, mm -hmm. or I have a friend who belongs to a certain community, he's a Jain, he's a Christian, um, those kinds of things were very um, 
invisible when it came to say a school setting or even community settings where uh, the pujas which happen in Hindu temples happened um, in uh, my home me being a Muslim as much as they happened uh, or near our factory or there was a uh, Hindu idol sitting in our factory right next to it we created a mosque uh, which the uh, Muslim workers used for their prayers um, and eventually and slowly in before my eyes this seems to have transformed into I actually can't be uh, communal because I have a Muslim friend and even without any communal aspects being involved people have started identifying each other based on their religious identities or based on their sub-community uh, and that is very new to me and it seems politically created uh, as well because of the current government that's in power and that seems to uh, get a ton of uh, privilege out of that creation, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I was wondering if you see parallels between what's happening in the US and what's happening in India, and if this seems to be, like you said, history repeats itself, mm -hmm. a recreation of segregation all over the world. Mm -hmm. over yes, uh, I have to be really careful about answering that question, mainly because I like to come back to India. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like I want to. <laughs> be banned from it. Um, I, I mean, my, my knowledge about this country is quite limited. I'm, I'm not even going to pretend that I know very much about it. Uh, and then the information that I know uh, comes from the media. And yeah, I mean, do I necessarily believe uh, everything that is published? No, I do not. Uh, so, I mean, my experience is um, with regards to how, let's say, divisions um, are being identified um, around the world. I mean, not just only in India or the United States, but around the world. Um, I often, you know, in my uh, introduction to international relations uh, class, I often mention um, um, Samuel P. Huntington's Clash of Civilizations and how, in many instances, people have really grasped it. You know, you got the West and you have Islam, and there's a clash there. And, you know, I, I think it simplifies uh, the complexity of our world uh, and it allows a lot of people, even the educated people, to kind of like, you know, grab onto something and say, oh, yes, uh, there, there's a clash going on here, a uh, clash between Sunni and Shia, you know. Oh, okay, yes, you know, uh, what's happening in Iraq, Sunni and Shia, you know, or, or what's happening, you know, in other parts of the world. We, we always have these labels, you know, these generalizations. Um, are there parallels? I, I would say that perhaps on the surface one could say that there are parallels. Uh, there are two very distinct societies, uh, countries with very, very distinct national histories. So I wouldn't uh, say that they're mirroring each other, but perhaps the use of certain terms by the media is something that one could say is found, right? So if, if you are a uh, Muslim, then that appellation tends to be thrown around and then it has a certain connotation, right? So if you, if you were just to do an experiment, you know, go uh, to, to a, a group of American students uh, somewhere in the Midwest or something and say, okay, well, I'm gonna say Islam and you write down the first things that, that you think. And it'd be kind of interesting to see what, what, how do they see a, a Muslim in, or, or vice versa, right? Um, but maybe that's, that's something that we definitely have in common in terms of the media in both countries. Um, don't necessarily, uh, let's say, take the time to make uh, clear what they're trying to do here. Are, are you throwing out a term to, to kind of like facilitate generalization, negative generalization, or, or are you really describing something factual, right? Uh, a, a person, you know, uh, it's interesting. It involves one person and then th this man, a Muslim man. It's like, why did you have to mention their, their you know, religious identity? I mean, I, I don't necessarily go around, you know, looking at my friends and saying, oh, by the way, you know, what religion do you follow? I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I, I just, that's, that's how I see, you know, myself as religion may be a part of my identity, but I, I don't put it there at the forefront. But at the same time, uh, there are individuals who really do feel that this religious identity is extremely important for them, and so I respect it. I want to also highlight something, and that is diversity. 
uh, diversity is not just simply the superficial type of diversity. You know, men, women, you know, black, white, you know, Latino, you know, um, Asian, you know, diversity is also ideas. And, and we're, we're, we're actually closing the space towards ideational diversity. We don't want to hear the other side. We want to live in echo chambers. Um, and sometimes I'm at fault, you know, I try to surround myself with people who, you know, think the same way, you know, and then I think, oh, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm right. But I sometimes even try to step, take a step uh, out and, 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 you know, think differently. But parallels, there, there must be some parallels, but uh, for me to, to be very, very pointed would be um, not very, sub, um, not necessarily substantive, but I, I feel rather uncomfortable. But in terms of perhaps how the media uses certain terms to describe communities. Uh, and again, those uh, descriptions being quite negative, maybe that's what we find. Again, the media. Maybe, maybe by um, cultural background, uh, Mexicans are not necessarily the most optimistic group of people. <laughs> Mexicans are very fatalistic, and that, that is very true. Um, 2018, we'll have the World Cup. Mexico's in a group with Sweden, Germany, and South Korea. Mexico's first match is against Germany. No one's talking about winning. Everyone's talking about well, how much will we lose by? Because that will affect the rest of our tournament. If we lose 5 nil, that means we're going to have to uh, make sure that uh, we beat Sweden uh, at least 2 nil, and then South Korea, 3. We're fatalistic. We're, we're not necessarily the most positive individuals. Um, I'm not very optimistic. And the reason is, and I'm not going to point the finger at the media and say it's their fault. Um, I'm not op optimistic because what I see is that uh, we as individuals make a choice not to get involved. Um, we as individuals um, accept um, the direction of certain individuals, uh, our leaders, and believe, well, we need to follow. Uh, we don't want to challenge authority. We don't want to question it. Um, and we also don't want to come up with solutions, alternatives. I, I don't see it. And I'm, I'm not going to say, well, you know, uh, that's them. I sometimes find myself in a situation where I need to demonstrate that leadership. Um, and I don't necessarily meet, uh, meet the call. Um, so my pessimism is tied to the fact that I don't see people really making it um, their responsibility to make things better and positive, to actually grow um, what we have and, and to really embrace you know, the uniqueness of uh, what we are experiencing. So me being here in India, I mean, this is incredible. You know, I've, I'm learning so much. Um, but there would be other people who would say, well, there aren't enough McDonald's around here. You know, and where, where's the Starbucks? I, I'm not looking for that. If I want that, I could go to another country. I want, I want something different. I want this diversity. And I need it. Um, I'm not optimistic, but that's just me. But I definitely can tell you this much. Um, if I see someone who's worthy of following, I will. And... Um, 
I, I will do my best to, to make sure that, you know, that vision actually becomes real. Where's our uh, Martin Luther King? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? Um, Say that it, it's still there, but uh, maybe um, it's not something that uh, has has really caught uh, the attention of the media or the caught you know the attention of uh, the national body politic. Um, you know, you, you can find it in in many different you know parts of America. You know, small towns where people are now more active politically, um, and and it ranges you know from. Uh, young people to you know uh, senior citizens uh, working together. I mean, finally realizing, hey, we 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 you know we we're owners of of this, and, and we need to uh, assume some responsibility, some leadership. Uh, it's going to. Um, I I would say that 
In many instances, Professor Rosencrantz, yeah, you kind of like forced me to <laughs> be a little bit more optimistic, you know, that maybe, yes, that this isn't a trend. Maybe, maybe we need uh, to give it a little bit more time to, to see perhaps, you know, the fruition of, of something more positive. Um, you know, uh, university campuses. Um, you know, that, that's, that's perhaps one area that m maybe needed, you know, to, to be shooken up. I mean, compared, you know, university campuses, you know, nowadays to the 1960s. Big difference. Big difference. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You know, and almost anywhere in the world nowadays, you know, university campuses are dead quiet. 1960s. I mean, they, they were the hotbed of ideological movement and, you know, just, just questioning, you know, w what kind of world do we want, you know, for, for our children and whatnot. Um, there are places, and, and hopefully the, you know, the, the media will, will be able to start, you know, sh shining the spotlight, rather than being so negative, you know, maybe to, to start shining the spotlight in those places of, of America, not only just simply America, but, but also India and in Europe and whatnot, where, where people are really, really just simply saying, no, we're not going to accept this. We're going to embrace this, this diversity. We're going to create something that, that is quite unique. And the idealism that you mentioned, I would say again, it's not only just American. It's, it's something that you know, um, is, is found throughout the, throughout the world. Um, you know, people learn from each other, especially nowadays because of technology, social media. We learn from each other, um, different contexts, but, but we learn and, and we, I think, you know, uh, we, we try to aspire for, for something better. Um, but um, I, I liked what you mentioned in the very beginning about movies. I, I, can, I, I can go on and on about movies. I love movies. But uh, this year, if, uh, if you have the chance, there's a new movie coming out with Christian Bale. The Western. It's a Western. The Western is, is something so quintessential American. Um, but it's a very interesting storyline, mainly because it involves uh, Native Americans as well. We're finding uh, an American soldier who, you know, has been fighting against Native Americans. And yet it's interesting that within, you know, this, this story, you find the conflict within this American soldier, the moral and ethical conflict. I, I was born knowing what is right and what is wrong, but for most of my adult life, I've been killing um, and then all of a sudden, you know, he finds himself at a crossroads, what to do next. Um, sometimes the movies show us a reality that uh, maybe we need to take that extra step. That's it. I, I need to change. I need to start demonstrating that leadership to do what is right rather than continuously following uh, what is the norm or following orders. Um, but bear in mind, and this is something that I like to remind everyone, every single war that we talk about that involves America, the United States, it's being fought by young people. And these people were raised to know what is right and what is wrong. And for these individuals to go around starting to kill and to all of a sudden say, be told it's okay, there, there is a psychological impact. Uh, a real, real profound psychological impact. Um, and in many instances, these individuals make, you know, make a choice. This is wrong, I will protest, and I will start telling other people you know, that uh, this should not be permitted. Um, so that's one of the things I like about you know, these particular Westerns. Um, another one that I really liked uh, was uh, three, 310 to Yuma. The, the, newer, the newer version. Yes, it, it was done b before, but the, the newer version, uh, the one with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale, I might add, uh, great, great dichotomy of, you know, you have the bad man all of a sudden making the decision to save a good man. Um, Any good man making a decision to fight for something um, that he felt was greater than himself. Um, so maybe we need to pay closer attention to our movies. Um, <laughs> By the way, there's a piece in the new uh, Western too. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, I have to check it out then. Well, thank you so much for um, your presentation. It was extremely heartwarming. It was, uh, parts. It was almost like a watching movie that were like, going through a set of emotions uh, up and down. Um, there was pessimism, there was optimism, the 
this hope, and there was the deflux of hope in Marx. Uh, so um, at this point, I would invite Professor John Miglu to give you a pin for our movement, uh, which we are trying to start. And hopefully, um, we will gain enough momentum and not just create followers in, within this university campus, try to create uh, some people who would at least try and lead um, us to a slightly better future, and not a pessimistic.